We have a tape series called A Judeo-Christian Understanding of the Antichrist, where we look at types of the Antichrist, shadows of the beast, Judas Iscariot, Baxter and Solomon, the major figures in the Bible that teach or prefigure Antichrist. But today, this afternoon, I want to look at a different aspect. Turn to 1 John, please, again. Chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. Now, as we talked about last night, last hour here does not mean the end of the age. What it means is the New Testament era. The rapture and resurrection have already begun with the ascension and resurrection of Christ. From God's perspective, Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 22. He fulfills the Hebrew feast of first fruits during Hag Pesach. The resurrection has already begun, the rapture has already begun, Jesus simply being the first fruit of it, as we looked at last night. From God's perspective, it already is the last days. The rapture and resurrection have already begun with the resurrection and ascension of Christ. What we are waiting for is not the rapture or the resurrection, we are waiting for our role in it. That is the general sense of last days, not the specific sense. Here, we're looking at the general sense. Last night, we looked at something more specific, okay? This is the more general sense. It's an ambiguous term. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard, that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. Okay. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you all know, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Yeshua is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, definite article in Greek, the one who denies the Father and Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Again, on the Antichrist case, we look at these ultimate two beasts. We have to think of Antichrist three ways. The two beasts in Revelation 13, which Revelation doesn't actually call Antichrist, but that's who they are. Remember, it's the Apostle John who is most concerned with the phenomena of Antichrist in his Gospel. In his epistle and in Revelation, he wrote all three, John is more concerned with Antichrist than any of the other apostles, even more than Paul. Now, the reason he's more concerned is because John wrote a gospel different than the other gospels. The synoptics are concerned with showing Jesus as a servant, as a king, as a man. John is concerned with showing Jesus as God. He's concerned with the deity of Christ. So therefore, because he's more concerned with the person of Christ, he's more concerned with explaining the satanic counterfeit of him, okay? He's more concerned with the nature of the Messiah as a divine being than the other Gospels. So you've got these two beasts in Revelation. Then there are many antichrists. And the fact at this time in history that we've seen a proliferation of demagogues having themselves deified, as we looked at last night. We live in the last 50, 60 years, Stalin and Hitler, Mussolini, Kim Il-sun, Nikolai Ceausescu, Pol Pot, Idi Amin, all these men are the same. They're the same spirit, man wanting to be deified. Right in the beginning, man wanted to be God. That's what Satan tried to persuade him of in the garden as we looked at yesterday. So there's many. 
Now, the only thing by technical definition an antichrist means, or a false, sorry, a false Christ, not an antichrist, a false Christ is somebody with a false anointing. A false Christ is merely somebody with a false anointing. Literally, that's what it means etymologically. But we're not talking about that exactly now. We're talking about antichrist. Two beasts, many antichrists, but it is a spirit of antichrist. A spirit of antichrist. It is a spirit that's already in the world and always has been, but which but whose proliferation multiplies in the last days. Okay? It's a spirit that's always been here, but its activity multiplies. It becomes more prolific. The spirit of Antichrist is closely associated with the mystery of iniquity. It is, strictly speaking, not the same, but it is closely associated with it. We will never understand the mystery of iniquity unless we understand the spirit of Antichrist. Okay? And we will never understand the spirit of Antichrist unless we fully understand the mystery of iniquity. Now again, we have the tapes on the Antichrist. I don't want to focus on what's on those tapes. Those tapes deal with these two beasts and those who foreshadow them in the Bible. You know, the number of the beast 666 occurs many places in the Bible. Many places. It occurs twice with Baxter and Solomon. It occurs in Ezra. It occurs in the Aramaic text of Daniel's vision of Nebuchadnezzar's image, statue, before people begin counting the Roman numerals or Latin value of the Henry Kissinger's name. The first thing they should do is look where else that number occurs in the Bible. Silly. First, look what the Bible says about that number. And it's quite startling. If you're interested, get the tapes. Today, we're looking at the spirit of Antichrist. These two beasts will ultimately embody it. The first word we have to look at, and the first concept we have to understand is this. Antichrist, as you've heard me point out, does not only mean against, it means in place of in place of. You put something in place of him, then it becomes against him. Antichristos in Greek. Now on the Antichrist tapes we talk about how the title of the Pope is, the title he takes is not just Pontificus Maximus, it's Vicarius Christos. The one who acts vicariously for Christ. There is actually a vicar of Christ, biblically. In John's Gospel again, Jesus tells us the true vicar of Christ is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He acts in place of Christ. When you put somebody else in place of the Holy Spirit, that is Antichrist. For instance, Jesus said, one is your teacher who's in heaven. That's why we call our ministry Moriel. We want people to look to God, not to man. The Holy Spirit illuminates the scriptures for us. Okay? Jesus said, he will teach you, he will remind you all I've taught you. It's a function of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Pope claims to be able to speak infallibly in defining doctrine, speaking ex cathedra, since 1854, that he can't make a mistake. He makes himself infallible. Only God's infallible. You attribute infallibility to a man acting in place of Christ. The Pope's title, Vicarius Christus, in Latin. You translate Vicarius Christus in Latin into Greek, it is exactly Antichristus. When he puts on a tiara, every Pope says, I'm Antichrist, but again, you can get the Antichrist tapes. It's the spirit we're looking at now. Antichristus, but also this word. Pseudo Logan. is the word Paul uses for false doctrine. Pseudo-logan. Now the word pseudo doesn't only tell us it is false. It is something which is false that attempts to look 
real. A pseudo-intellectual. They try to look like an intellectual. Pseudo-musician. Pseudo. A pseudonym. It's not the real name. Just try to look like the real name. Pseudo. Pseudo logon. Jesus is the incarnate word. Simply a different case ending of logos. Pseudo logon is false doctrine. False doctrine is false logos. It is another Christ. He is the incarnate word. False doctrine is the spirit of Antichrist. The Bible is the word of the Messiah. The word became flesh. The first thing we have to understand looking at the spirit of Antichrist is false doctrine. False doctrine is the spirit of Antichrist. It is a false logos. Jesus is the logos. Okay. Pseudo logon. There is more to false doctrine than most people realize. There is a spirit on back of it. Now we have many takes talking about this and how leaven, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. We have a plethora of material that you can order or listen to or whatever. Today we're looking at the fact there is a spirit on back of it. Now, as we read in John, that which denies the father-son relationship, there is a colossal distinction between biblical Judaism and rabbinic Judaism. You have three kinds of Judaism. The first kind of Judaism is Mosaic. It is what comes from Moses and the Torah. Mosaic Judaism is perfectly true, totally valid, and fulfilled in the Messiah Yeshua. The second kind of Judaism is Messianic. That was the original Christianity. It is simply Jews who realized he was the Messiah and fulfilled the Torah. Original Christianity was simply Jews who realized he was the Messiah who fulfilled the Torah. So you have Messianic Judaism and Mosaic Judaism. Mosaic Judaism has not existed since 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Paul uses the Greek word Tatargeo. Katargeo, inoperative, rendered inoperative. The prophet Daniel said the Messiah would come and die before the second temple would be destroyed in Daniel chapter 9. We have tapes explaining that. So suppose you were driving and you were trying to park in the shopping district, say down in Sea Point or down by the aquarium. And it said that there is a 1,000 rand fine for anyone not having a valid parking sticker. So you went over to buy the valid parking sticker from the machine, but the machine was broke. And you tried to explain to a meter maid, well, the machine is broke, what am I supposed to do? And the meter maid says, tough, that's your problem. If there's no sticker on picketing, yeah, but there's no way to buy a ticket. That is the third kind of Judaism. No temple, no high priest. The third kind of Judaism is Talmudic. So you write a note and you put the note on the windscreen and says, 
ticket machine broke, please do not ticket. The meter maid doesn't care. That's the law. However, somebody comes along and says, just before the machine broke, I bought one for you. And it's good for another four hours. Take mine. Here, it's free. It's a gift. That is messianic. Mosaic is 1,000 Rand fine, put the sticker in the window. Messianic is the machine's broke, you can't buy it. Here, I'm giving you as a gift. I'll fulfill the requirement of the law for you. Talmudic is, well, that may be what the law says, and maybe somebody else wants to give me the sticker, but I don't want the sticker. I'm going to make my own law. Okay? It denies the father-son relationship. Talmudic Judaism is not the Judaism of Moses, neither is it the true Judaism of the Messiah. What Moses taught is valid, what Jesus taught is valid. What the rabbis invented is a false Judaism, which to this day has rejected and persecuted Jewish believers. In the first century, they were persecuting Jews who believed that is why Jesus called it a synagogue of Satan. Jesus called it a synagogue of Satan because it was persecuting believing Jews and their families with something called the Birkat Menim, and because it was leading Jewish people away from their own Messiah and the way of salvation. Hence, we see this spirit that's in Roman Catholicism. False Christianity is the spirit of Antichrist. It puts something in place of him. Rabbinic Judaism. In Roman Catholicism, you replace the Holy Spirit with a man. You replace the true vicar with a false one. In Judaism, you replace the Torah with mitzvot. Now what is Talmud? What is Roman Catholic dogma? What's the Roman Catholic Catechism? What's Talmud? Pseudo Logan. They attempt to attribute doctrinal authority to the traditions of men. Roman Catholicism cannot exist without doing the very thing Jesus said the Pharisees would go to hell for. Teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. When you point out to a Roman Catholic or to a Mormon that they are adding to the Bible, the New Testament, they all add something. And you point to the end of Revelation and you say, the last thing Jesus said in the New Testament was that if you add to this book, God will add to you the judgments. And if you take away, he'll take away your name in the book of life. The standard Roman Catholic responses and the standard Mormon responses, that is only about the book of Revelation. That's how they try to get out of it. No, it is not. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself in Apollos for your sakes, that in us you might learn not to exceed what is written. It is not just revelation. And it certainly includes revelation. It's specific to revelation, but it is not exclusive of the rest of the Bible. It's put at the very end of the whole Bible, the whole scripture, the whole canon for a reason. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, that you may learn not to exceed what is written. That is what the Pharisees and Sadducees did. Only then it was not written yet. Then it was called Torah Be'al Peh, the oral law. The rabbis teach that the opinion of a thousand and one rabbis, sages, is greater than the opinion of a thousand prophets. The prophets were only messengers who had to write this stuff down. But the great Ga'onim, the great genius rabbis, have to interpret it. Okay. 
Same thing in Catholicism. Was this given on Mount Sinai to Moses? Was the Talmud and the Mishnah and so forth given on... Turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 8. At the very end, Joshua chapter 8, verse 35. It says the same thing in the Torah, but I'm reading it from Joshua. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers who were living among them. Everything God commanded had to be written down. Torah Baal Pei fundamentally contradicts the Hebrew Scriptures. So when you add something to the Bible and claim it's the Word of God and it winds up being in place of what the Bible says, the Bible says, don't go beyond what's written. Everything that Moses was told by God, he wrote down. By putting something in place of that, you go against it. It is pseudo logon. Eventually, in the second century, under Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, they began writing it down. Pseudo logon is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, I began with Catholics and Jews for two reasons. My own family, as you know, is a mixture of Roman Catholic and Jewish. I don't want people to think I'm picking on anybody. i have been with my own family. Okay. Every false religion ascribing belief in Jesus in any way will have two characteristics. The first is pseudo-logon, and the second is anti-Christos. Islam, it is the Quran. Muhammad, denies the father and son relationship. On the Dome of the Rock, on the Temple Mount, is an inscription from a surat in the Quran, God has no son. Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. The Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, about the Jewish Messiah, they apply to Muhammad. Now Muhammad grew up next to the well of Zumzum adjacent to Kaaba. His father's name was Abdullah, the servant of Allah. The Hajj already existed, the Kaaba already existed, and it was associated with Allah was the Arabian moon god. The only thing Muhammad attempted to do was monotheize the pagan religions of ancient Arabia under the influences of Judaism, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism. We have this on other tapes. So he gets a pseudo-logon, and instead of Jesus being the name above all names, they say there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet, blessed be his name. Not blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be Muhammad. Islam denies the father-son. To a Muslim saying God has a son means God had sex with a human woman. Which is not true. But that's what they say. You're, that's what they say the incarnation of Christ announced to. Strangely, the Mormons come along and say God did have sex with a woman. They call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Only their Jesus Christ is not ours. Their Jesus Christ is the half-brother of Satan. But it begins with the pseudo-logon, the Book of Mormon. And it begins with an anti-Christos, someone whose teachings are put in place of Christ, Joseph Smith. Now, Muhammad would not claim to be in place of Jesus. He claimed to be in addition, further revelation. The Mormons wouldn't claim Joseph Smith and Brigham Young are in place of Jesus. They claim to be in addition. Once you have a pseudo-logon, it is spirit of Antichrist. It will replace 
what is true. You cannot have pseudo logon without winding up with Antichrist. And so it is with the Mormons. It doesn't matter if they come in the name of Christian, as in Roman Catholicism or as in Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever. And it doesn't matter if it comes in the name of Judaism. It doesn't matter. It is pseudo-logan. It is a false word. Jesus is the true word, the word who became flesh. Pseudo-logan is the spirit of Antichrist. And eventually, you're going to find somebody lift, being lifted up in place of him. Because somebody's teaching is being lifted up in place of his. Okay. Pseudo Logan. Let's take this further and see how this spirit works. Now, it'll have its climax with these two beasts that are coming. But we're looking not at the personalities of the characters now, we're looking at the spirit. That same spirit, what you see in Islam, Mormons, Rabbinic Judaism, Roman Catholicism, it's all spirit of Antichrist. You understand? It all comes from a pseudo Logan. <coughs> now, I'm not nearly as concerned about false doctrine among non-believers as I am with pseudo-logon among born-again believers. I'm concerned about it. I'm concerned for their salvation. I'm concerned for the salvation of Catholics, of Mormons, of Jews, etc. I'm concerned for their salvation. But what they believe isn't going to hurt us. We can help them. They can't hurt us. But when Pseudo Logan gets into the church, look he out. Let us see the ways in which Pseudo Logan permeates the evangelical church, the true body of Christ, the community of the elect, born again believers. Turn with me, please, first of all, to the Gospel of St. John chapter 12. In fact, we have a new tape on John 12, but we're only looking at one aspect of it now. Remember, John is... superlatively consumed with the phenomena of Antichrist more than any of the other apostles. John chapter 12, verse 4. But Yehuda Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 dollars and given to the poor? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he, as he had the money box, he used to pill for what was put into it. Now again, on the John 12 tapes, we explain the contrast here. Mary was interested in what she could get out of the box. Judas with what he could put in. You understand? It's contrasting the two of them. Get the John 12 tape if you're interested. It's called sold out or sell out. She was sold out for Jesus. He would sell Jesus out. On the Antichrist tapes, and I only mentioned it in passing, we talk of Judas as the son of perdition. Judas, whenever you see something of Judas, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something about the Antichrist, whenever you see it. They are the only two people called, with a definite article, the son of perdition on a position. They're both into money, big time. Thirdly, 
Look how John describes Antichrist. We just read it. They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. The Bible describes Antichrist in the character of Judah, the same John. They went out. Now that word goes out, went out, same Greek apple as an apostasy, apostasy. Went out from us. Son of perdition, they went out from us. They are both into money. They are the only two people demon possessed by Satan personally. Many people have been demon possessed, but it says Judas, Judas, Satan entered him. And so it is with the beasts. They were not demonically possessed, satanically possessed. Now, there's more to it than this. You can get the Antichrist tapes and the John 12 tapes. And listen, I only mention it in passing relative to our subject of the spirit of Antichrist. This stuff is Antichrist. It's on the other tapes. But I had to mention it in passing. Could this not have been sold and given to the poor? Now look at the synoptic accounts. Look at Mark 14, 4. This is also on the Antichrist tapes, but today we're looking at it from a different aspect. Some were indignantly remarking, why has this perfume been wasted? It could have been sold for 300 denarii given to the poor. That's what it says in Mark's version. Matthew 26, 8 puts it slightly differently. In Matthew's version, it reads like this. But the disciples were indignant why this waste, the perfume might have been sold. Notice it is Judas, then some of the disciples, then it is all of them. Remember, he is the son of perdition. They couldn't tell who he was till Jesus revealed him. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Not until Yeshua revealed him did they know who he was. Not until Yeshua reveals him will we know who he is. If you can't see through Benny and Kenny, you're never going to see through this guy. If you can't see through an obvious heretic, an obvious hype artist, an obvious false prophet, you'll never see through these guys. If you can't see through Raymond, all this nonsense, you won't be able to see through this. You won't have a chance. What is it I? But again, that's the Antichrist case. What is he going to do? What is the spirit of Antichrist today that we see sucking in Christians? A social gospel. We are not called to redeem society. We are called to see people saved out of society. We are called to be a morally redeeming influence in it as witnesses, to be salt and light in it, so people will want to be saved out of it. But the world is in the power of the wicked one. We do not do good works to get saved. We do good works because we have been saved. David here runs Memorial Orphanage for the AIDS babies. We don't do that to get saved. We do that because we've been saved. He doesn't come here from England and live, out, live where he lives because he's trying to get to heaven. He and his wife do that because they're on their way to heaven. Okay. A social gospel. Have you heard of the Salvation Army? The Salvation Army was begun by William Booth, a saved Christian. Today, most of the Salvation Army is no longer evangelical. It is mostly a social gospel. There may be people in it who are still saved, but that organization is not loyal to the original beliefs of Colonel Booth or Captain Marshall, his granddaughter. Have you heard of the Boy Scouts?
Mr. Baden-Powell was a saved Christian. That organization, although they're battling in America to stop homosexuals from being scout leaders, have you heard of World Vision? That began as a gospel preaching organization. Now it is a social gospel. Have you heard of Christian aid? There is nothing Christian about Christian aid by any biblical definition. And like World Vision, and like Tear Fund in New Zealand, they are vehemently anti-Israel, pro-Palestine, pro-Islam. Have you heard of Bernardo's in England? Dr. Bernardo was founded by the Plymouth Brethren. He was Plymouth Brethren. It was founded by the Brethren. Now his headquarters in East London is a Freemason place. They abrogated their evangelical statement of faith some time ago. Every one of these organizations began as gospel preaching. Every denomination, the Methodists, began as gospel preaching, reaching the poor. The biggest need of a hungry, homeless person is not a roof over the head and food in their stomach. That's their second biggest need. Now, if we negate their human need and just give them the gospel, we're hypocrites. We have no testimony. But if you just say, I'm going to ignore your spiritual need and meet your human need, that is not biblical Christianity. It is a social gospel. If an organization stops being evangelistic, it will eventually, sooner or later, usually sooner than later, once it stops being evangelistic, will cease being evangelical. By biblical definition of the word evangelion, gospel preaching. They just become social organizations. Once they go down that road, you will find them getting more and more ecumenical, more and more interfaith, and more and more political. Redefining morality in political terms instead of in biblical terms. The social gospel, could it have not been used for the poor? They don't care about the poor. The poor was only a means to power. Look at your country. Look at what has happened. This is a nation that exchanged one evil for a worse one. Desmond Tutu does not preach the gospel as the New Testament teaches it. He again is one of those committed to a homosexual ordination, etc. He's into interfaith with the Hindus, the Sundwarmas, and the rest of it. To him, the gospel was a social salvation, a political salvation, Bring the ANC to power. Is this the way of salvation? Well, what used to be political violence is now crime. Black unemployment has more than doubled. Infant mortality, nobody knows statistically how much worse, but it's a lot worse. Black longevity has declined, according to the UN, by nearly seven years. You have a government who says AIDS is not caused by retrovirus, even though microbiology says by scientific decision, although medical and scientific decision says it is, the political decision is no, it isn't. <laughs> You understand? Yes. Clinically and scientifically it is, but that's not politically correct. Politically it isn't. Are the poor any better off? No. The Dutch Reformed Church came, claimed to believe the gospel. How could anybody who believed the gospel be in the Buddhabund and be a racist? That was not Christianity. And neither is Desmond. You understand how it works? It is useless. Social gospels don't save society. New birth comes first. 
God changes people from the inside out. You are never going to change society with social programs. You're only going to change society by seeing God change people's hearts. Once people are born again, social evils disappear. That's how slavery was abolished in the British Empire. That is how Shaftesbury and Walter Force and Dr. Bernardo combated the social evils of their era. Once you begin replacing the gospel of Jesus with a social gospel, you have pseudo Logan. How will the Antichrist get power? A social gospel will be his first calling card. Look how he cares for the poor. The son of perdition does not care about the poor. The poor are simply a way to get power, just like the ANC, just like the communists. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's not the issue. That's the social gospel. A pseudo logan. Lord, is it I? Lord, it can't be Judas. Look how he cares for the poor. Again, if you can't see through Mother Teresa of Calcutta, you won't see through this guy. When she got the Nobel Prize, she stated, she stated, when she got the Nobel Prize, I do not convert these poor people of Calcutta to be Christians. I convert them to be better Hindus and better Muslims. I always ask the question, well, how do you convert somebody to be a better Muslim? Give them a hand grenade? Take him up off the streets of Calcutta, clean him up, give him a clean place to die with dignity, and send him to hell in a laundry chute. Nomini patri cum filio cum spiritu santo. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go to hell, go directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. <laughs> How dare you say that about Mother Teresa? She gave her life for the poor. Did she give her life for Jesus? She said she doesn't give these people the gospel. If you can't see through her, this guy is going to make her seem like the whore of Babylon. But that's on the Antichrist tape. We're looking at the spirit of it. You understand? When you see these churches being increasingly consumed with the social gospel, and we can't have this war. Jesus lived in a politically charged environment in an occupied country. And while he addressed the political events of his day and of what was to come, in terms of recognizing it as prophetically significant, Jesus confined his political interest to recognizing the, the prophetic significance of it. He refused to be dragged in to secular politics or to identify his message with it. He refused. Yes, recognize what it means prophetically, but he refused to be dragged in to political sides. He didn't tell the Roman soldiers, stop being Roman soldiers. That's not what he told the Roman soldier to do. Christianity is pacifist, and why didn't Jesus tell the Roman soldier to lay his weapons down and stop being a Roman legionary? That's not what he told them. Pseudo Logan. People come up with some other way. It's the way God leads you in the situation. Let's look. Number one, spirit of Antichrist is a social gospel. World vision. Here from New Zealand, Christian aid, spirit of Antichrist. If you are not preaching Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again, you must repent and be born again. If that is not the basis of your gospel, your gospel is not the gospel of Jesus. Turn with me to Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 8, But even though we or an angel from heaven 
should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema, accursed. There's only one gospel. It's not sacramental salvation, and it's not social salvation. It's not political redemption. It's the new birth. Salvation by faith justification. By grace, Jesus, that's it. The good works we do are a result of our salvation. It's not the means to salvation. Now look what happens. Jesus refused political power when it was offered to him. He refused. They wanted a Messiah who would get rid of the Romans the way the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks 160 years earlier. That was not his purpose in his first coming as the son of Joseph. That's his purpose in his second coming as the son of David. Hamashiach ben Yosef, Hamashiach ben David. This is the right and the left. Let's begin with the right, because I'm a conservative. I don't want the people to think that I'm picking on other people. I'm being with my own camp. In the United States, we have a fundamentalist Baptist, independent Baptist preacher called Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell called Sun Young Moon, the Korean cult leader, who says he's the return of Jesus Christ. Jerry Falwell said this man is an unsung hero. Because Moon gave him money for his Bible college. And because Falwell agrees with him politically. Forget about the fact that he's an antichrist. Forget about the fact that he says he's the return of Christ, the Lord of the Second Advent. Forget about that. His politics are right. He's a hero. This is an evangelical. In the United States, I'll go to the left now. Two out of three black children are born out of wedlock. The founders of the civil rights movement in America were largely Christian, at least in orientation. Booker T. Washington. Martin Luther King was a Baptist minister who came from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The Bible does not make a distinction between social sin and personal sin. Sin is sin. So we have the Reverend Jesse Jackson, a black Baptist preacher. Corporations and foundations are donating millions to help black kids in the inner cities of America. Skins the money, pays an astronomical salary to the mother of the baby he had out of wedlock. That's the role example for the black kids of America. Our leader is getting girls knocked up. Oh, but that's okay. His politics are right. He's a good brother. He <laughs> now, the Bible says, even if he repented, he couldn't be a minister anymore. The Lord's ministers have to be above reproach. If he really repented, he'd hang up his, his claims to be a preacher. They do it on the left, they do it on the right. The Dutch Reformed Church did it here, and on the left, on the right, the Dutch Reformed Church did it here, on the left, Tutu did it here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who does it, what their ideology is, what party, it's not biblical. It is antichrist. You wind up with the person. They'll be lifting up somebody as the way of salvation other than Jesus. It doesn't matter if it's Reverend Moon or Mandela. They'll lift somebody up. Let's go beyond this. Always look to Israel and the Jews. Where did they get it right? Where did they get it wrong? Look to John 5.
What does Jesus say in this chapter? He tells us some very incredible things. He says, I come in my Father's name, and you do not believe. But if another comes in my name, him you shall believe. The Antichrist will in some way convince the Jews he's the promised Mashiach and make a covenant with them. There's two beasts, I'm quite convinced one will be a Jew. There are arguments against this, but I'm quite convinced. They're not going to follow a pygmy or an Eskimo. <laughs> one of those beasts will be a Jew, and I'm telling you, I'm not saying it's him or anything like this, I'm not saying he's the false prophet. But forget about Kissinger or Prince Charles. You want to look out for somebody. Look out for Cardinal Jean Marais, Mr. J. of Paris, who's a Jew and potentially a future pope. I'm not saying it's him, I'm just saying if you're going to watch somebody, watch him. Pay attention. Jesus says, Don't think it's me who accuses you in John 5, it's Moses and the prophets. It'll be Moses. The problem that unsaved Jews have is not that they reject Jesus. That's not their problem. The fact that unsaved Jews reject Yeshua as their Messiah, that's not their problem. That is the result of their problem. The problem is they reject Moses and the Torah and the prophets. If they really believed Moshe Rabbeinu, if they really believed the Hebrew Scriptures, they would know he's the Messiah. Jesus isn't going to condemn them. Moses is. Their problem is not that they reject Jesus. Their problem is they reject Moses. Why do you reject Moses? Because of a pseudo-logan. What else do we see? How else does this spirit operate in the church? The world is there. It's always been there. Other religions, it's always been there. And, of course, will become exasperated in the last days, but it's always been there. I mean, we exist in the church. The Pope claims to be the vicar of Christ, the Pontificus Maximus, the bridge builder between all faiths, the same as the pagan emperor was. Ecumenism is the spirit of Antichrist. But we've touched on that. Let's go further. The only thing Jesus had to do, not to be crucified, the only thing he had to do to escape Calvary, the only thing he had to do to vindicate himself and save his neck was put on a show. He only had to put on a show for Herod, and of course he said, no, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. We've said many times, he did not allow signs and wonders to be the focus of his message or his ministry. These signs follow. You see people flocking to a stadium to see Benny and Kenny. That is the spirit of Antichrist. Look at Matthew 24. Counterfeit signs and wonders, Revelation 13, 13, pretended signs and wonders, 2 Timothy chapter 3, they'll come like Jonas and John Brays. Who were Jonas and John Brays? Pharaoh's magicians. What did they do? Counterfeit miracles. Jesus never allowed his seen benefla oaths, signs and wonders, to be the focus of his message or his ministry. Biblically, it's these signs follow. Instead, it is the John Wimber, Derek Morphew gospel of signs and wonders. The Vineyard Movement, John Wimber's epic power evangelism, signs and wonders are the key to belief. Then how come Jesus said, for which one of these signs do you stone me? The same people who saw the miracle 72 hours later were yelling, crucify him. 
Does faith come by seeing a show? No. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing the word of God. The signs follow. When you see people having a signs and wonders gospel, it is the spirit of Antichrist. Not signs and wonders, but when that's their focus, when you see miracle crusade, healing crusade, Jesus never had a healing crusade, he never had a miracle crusade. Oh, he had healings and miracles, but his crusades were about repentance. His kingdom was not of this world. Oh, yes, it is, says the Reconstructionist Calvinist. Oh, yes, it is, says the kingdom now dominionist. Kingdom now theology, Rick Godwin, Macaulay's friend. Overrealized eschatology. What is it? He says, it's not now. My king is not of this world. Instead of thy kingdom come, it's thy kingdom has come, and it's us. What Isaiah 28 warns about. Roll to the crown of the proud drunkards of Ephraim. The self deification of the church. Same as Israel did. And part and parcel of this, and I don't want to go into it, I only mentioned it in passing. Prosperity. Instead of rich in grace, it's rich. Store up treasures where moth and rust won't devour them. Even if you get rich in this life, what good is it if you can't take it with you? Let's just talk about this world, not eternity. Let's look to eternity at a distance. Let's just talk about this world. If I was to say to you, you could be a multimillionaire now, had anything you wanted, you can live a lifestyle like Ray McCauley, you can do whatever you want, have anything you want in this life until the age of 85, then you'll be dead. Or you can wait for Jesus to come back and you can have anything you want on this planet, in this life, for a thousand years with no old age, no sickness, no, head, no strings attached. Which do you want? Breaking your neck to get the money most of your life and then being too old to enjoy it for the rest of it? Or would you rather have it for a thousand years? Then comes eternity when the real blessings come. As Jim Elliott, the American missionary who was martyred in South America said, no man is a fool who gives up what he cannot possibly keep in order to gain what he cannot possibly lose. That's Christianity. It is the spirit of Antichrist. Something else is in place of what's supposed to be there. Another logon, another word, word faith, they call it. You know what word faith is? Pseudo logon. And then, of course, there's the man of lawlessness. Remember, the spirit of Antichrist goes hand in hand with the mystery of iniquity. The man of lawlessness. Law in Greek, nomos. Lawless. A nomos. The Antichrist is a nomos. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 20. To the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as those under the law, that's the law of Moses, though not being myself under the law. Notice he's a Pharisee and a Jew, and even he was able to eat lobster if he wanted. 
but he chose not to for the sake of his testimony to Jews. That I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. What does he mean? If you get on an airplane at Johannesburg or Cape Town, and you fly to Germany, well, in South Africa, as in most British Commonwealth countries, apart from Canada, you drive on the left. The law says you keep left. You get off the plane in Frankfurt, you have to keep right. You have gone out from under the laws of South Africa, under the law of Germany. Can you say, I'm not under the law anymore, I'll drive in the left, the right, anywhere I feel like it. I'm not under the law anymore, I'm not in South Africa. You've come out from under one law and under another. There are do's and don'ts in the New Testament, the same as there are in the Old. You've come out from the law of Moses and gone under the law of Christ. Now there's much more to this than I'm saying, obviously. It's the difference between law and grace. But what grace means is the capacity to keep God's law that we didn't have in the Old Covenant. The Holy Spirit empowers us to meet his standard. The law teaches we're fallen, we have to sin. The Christians sin, yes, but they have to know we have a choice. You point to the Bible, oh, you're under the law, you're a legalist, you're a Pharisee. No, you are a Pharisee. You teach us precepts of God, the inventions of men. You're under the law. Yes, I'm under the law of Christ. Somehow, being under grace means no longer being under the law. No, being under grace means you're now empowered to keep the law. The law of Christ. You've gone out from the body of one jurisdiction under another. Now, when somebody says, that's it, I don't want the Bible, we're free in the spirit, you're a legalist. No law, that is a nomos. The Antichrist is anthropon a nomos, the man of lawlessness. When you see these silly people in the birdcage saying, you're a Pharisee, you're under the law, you're a legalist. No, they are lawless. The spirit of lawlessness. They don't want to know what's in the Bible. Adonos. Now look at it. How will the Antichrist con Christians who don't know the Bible and don't really love Jesus? Social gospel, political gospel, ecumenism, signs, wonders, kingdom now, prosperity, and Adonos, lawlessness. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Not just persons, it's a spirit. It's a spirit that's always been here. It always derives from a pseudo logon, another basis of doctrinal and spiritual authority other than the Word of God. Always. The pseudo logon produces an antichrist. It is a spirit, but it is a spirit which multiplies in intensity before Jesus comes back. And it is multiplied. A generation ago, you never would have found a fundamentalist Baptist calling a man who claims to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ a hero. A generation ago, there was far too much integrity in the black community to respect a womanizer who takes money from a charity to help poor black kids to pay exorbitant salaries to cover up for his child born out of wedlock. A generation ago, evangelical Christians would have had more sense than to call the Pope a man of God when the Pope kisses the Koran and says God has no son. A generation ago, it was different. It's getting worse. And it will get worse still. Now, on the caveats of the Olivet Discourse, we warn, forewarned is forearmed. 
knowing who these two beasts are when they show up. Forget this nonsense, the rapture can happen tonight. The rapture will not happen until the faithful can identify this guy. You don't believe Jesus can come tonight? Yeah, Jesus can come tonight for me, he can come tonight for you. But the rapture and resurrection is not happening until we know who this guy is. Second Thessalonians is clear. They've got to do all kinds of monkey tricks to get around what it plainly says. Let he who has wisdom count the number of the beast. If the only people who have wisdom are Christ, if he's our wisdom and the church isn't here, who's going to have the wisdom to know who he is? Before we deal with persons, we have to deal with character. Before we can look at the personalities, we have to look at the spirit. Antichrist is not coming. Antichrist is here in spirit. Just think. Is Jesus coming again? Yes. Is he here now? Yes. With two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in their midst. He's here now. He's coming, but he's here. Well, Antichrist is the same. He's coming, but he's here. He's here. He's here. If you don't know Jesus is here now, if you're not born again, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you don't know he's here now, you're not going to be prepared when he comes back, when he shows up. If you don't know he's here now, you're never going to be prepared for when he comes back. If you don't know he's here now, you will not be ready when he shows up. Antichrist is the same. If you don't know it's here now, you're not going to be ready when he shows up. Oh, he's coming. He's going to show up. But he's here now. It's the Spirit. Jesus is here. It's the Holy Spirit. Antichrist is here. It is the spirit of Antichrist. It is the social gospel, the political gospel, the ecumenical gospel, the signs and wonders gospel, the kingdom now gospel, the prosperity gospel. It is a nomos. It's a spirit. Which spirit are we on? At the end is a dichotomy. Those and only those who have the spirit of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Those and only those who have the spirit of Jesus will not succumb to the spirit of Antichrist. Those and only those who are ready for the coming of Christ will be ready for the coming of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is already among us. It is already in the church. Thank God the Holy Spirit of Christ is here also. God bless you tonight.